everyone, and welcome to the 253rd consecutive meeting of the Lexington Veterans Association. I'm Linda Dixon from the association. We're so happy to welcome another <coughs> fine crowd on a beautiful spring day. This is the um, revolutionary month here in Lexington in April. We have a wonderful revolutionary program to celebrate. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to ask us all to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, it's going to be led by our own Bill Stern, but we, we should all kind of turn around and look at him for a moment. Bill, raise your hand. He's wearing a very special jacket. Now, that is a Boston Marathon jacket. He ran the marathon in 1986, and he completed it in four hours, 56 minutes, four minutes <coughs> short of his goal of five hours. Isn't that great? So, we're off your baggy wars jacket today. Okay, Bill, if you will please lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Thank you very much. Our usual thanks for the coffee that keeps us going and promotes sociability to Starbucks of Lexington Center, our loyal supporter. Thank you to everyone who brought goodies to go with the delicious coffee, and thank you to everyone who dropped a little contribution in our coffee basket. Is anyone here for the first time today? Well, welcome. We're Thank delighted you. to welcome you. Who else raised your hand? Ah, hello again. Welcome. Uh, we hope that you will enjoy the program and make it a habit to come back and see us again. Uh, we would like very quickly to introduce our Veteran Services Director, Gina Rada, with a very brief Veterans Update. Hello, everyone. Um, so this month, you know, usually I'll get up and kind of say a little thing about what's going on um, as far as veterans' benefits are concerned or um, specific topics. But Linda has tasked myself and Dave Trust, who's in the back of the room, he's waving, um, to kind of get together once a month something highlighting a certain benefit or answering a certain question that you might have about certain veterans' benefits. So we have started, and this is our first volume, number one, volume one, number one. Um, they're all in the back of the room, and it says, where's your DD-214 on it? But it goes into um, further conversation about veteran cemeteries and how you sort of plan, if you can plan it all ahead, for um, burial purposes. So, talks a little bit about the veteran cemeteries in Massachusetts, but then of course your first um, item of business is to make sure that you have a DD-214, and if you don't, to get one. And I am somebody that can help you get one. And then also the second item of business is to make sure somebody else knows where it's at, because if it's hidden in a bottom drawer someplace, it's not gonna be of much use. So we talk about that a little bit on this, and we're gonna do this once a month, different, um, different topics. So if you have suggestions, Dave's email is on the top of this, his phone number is on the top of this, mine is not yet, but you can call Dave, he says. Um, call him with all your suggestions, and we will try to get all your questions answered, and we'll also send it out electronically so that you can have it on your email as well. So feel free to grab a copy. And there's going to be a portion on the Lexington Veterans Association website for these, so you can you can check them all out as we accumulate more um, articles. <coughs> Any questions quickly before I hand it back? Yes, well, sir. Hopefully quickly. But when I got off of that duty, I, I was instructed to, to go to the town clerk and register with the town clerk. Does that mean that they've kept it? 
bad information. So um, the town clerk doesn't keep DD-214s. <coughs> Every town's veterans officer may have a copy of your DD-214 if you gave it to them. We all have access to a database. We might be able to get it from there as opposed to going the National Archives three weeks route of putting in a request. Um, but if you did not drop off a copy of your DD-214 to your town's veterans officer, the chances that are, there's a copy there are very slim. So um, if any place you'd want to, and feel free anybody to bring, come to my office and drop off a copy and I can start a file and I can keep a file there for you. That way you always know where there is at least one copy that can be <coughs> accessible. Okay. Good advice. Thank you, Gina. Um, on this side table, next to the Bedford VA box, and it's getting full again. Thank you, thank you. We fill that box every month with your magazines and calendars and note cards. You just keep them coming. And Pat Costello keeps bringing them over to the VA hospital, and they keep appreciating them. So thank you very much. Also on that table are um, some very rough, just, just very uh, bare bones information on our fall programs, September through December. Just thought for your planning purposes, you'd like to know the subject matter, the speaker, the date. We'll flesh them out a little bit and put them on the website so you can learn more about the speakers very shortly. But Take one along so you can put them in your calendar and make sure you're here with us for the rest of the year. On April 3, just one week ago today, Lexington lost a true hero. Ario Piero, veteran of World War II, holder of a Purple Heart, and a Silver Star, died at the age of 100. The Boston Globe ran a wonderful tribute to Ario on April 6. There's a copy of the, uh, the obituary on that table uh, against the wall, and uh, it's there for anyone who'd like to read it. Please don't take it home with you, but feel free to read it. Let me share with you just a few details of this man's bravery and gallantry. Three days before Christmas, 1944, Sergeant Ario Piero and his platoon from the 33rd Armored Regiment were in Petit Coup in Belgium, protecting a building being used as a first aid station during the Battle of the Bulge. German forces launched a sudden mortar attack, scoring hits on some of the tanks, moving back from a bridge to the first aid station. Sergeant Piero sustained shrapnel wounds in his back. Over the next day and a half, before he made it to safety and had the shrapnel wounds removed from his back, Sergeant Piero led his unit as it fought off the German attack. He helped bring a wounded soldier across the nearby bridge for medical attention. He was awarded a silver star for valor and a purple heart for his injuries. He received a battlefield commission to lieutenant and commanded his, his platoon for the remainder of the war. By war's end, he was the only original member of his platoon who had landed on Omaha Beach in France in 1944, who was neither killed nor seriously wounded. We also lost another statesman citizen and uh, uh, state senator Ken Donnelly recently tragic loss Senator Donnelly fought a brave battle with cancer 
He served the community of Lexington loyally and well for many years. We will miss him greatly. Please stand. Let us offer a moment of silence for these two heroes. Thank you. Now we will move on with our program, and it's my pleasure to tell you about our speaker today. You may recognize Bob Lewis. First, he's a member of our group. He's, in fact, he's a member of the executive committee. Secondly, he gave the terrific presentation last year on the hunt for the Bismarck. Captain Bob Lewis spent seven years with the U.S. Navy as a patrol plane commander, <laughs> serving on the aircraft carriers Wasp, Intrepid, and Saratoga. He flew P-2s and P-3s as a reserve officer, and he commanded his reserve unit. He spent 20 years with the MITRE Corporation, including two assignments in Germany and headquarters U.S. <coughs> Army Europe. The first one, helping to develop joint communication systems to integrate the Army, Air Force, and Marines. And the second one, leading the communications engineering effort for an alternate command base in Romania. Now, although Bob is a Navy man, his interests in military history range far and wide. Today, he is speaking about an Army general who demonstrated his tactical, logistical, and strategic brilliance as a young officer at the very beginning of the Revolutionary War. It's July, 1775. The British troops, after their skirmishes in Lexington and Concord, have retreated to Boston, where they control the city and the harbor. General George Washington has just assumed command of the Continental Army, which has Boston surrounded. How to drive the British out of Boston? General Washington needed cannons. Washington turned to young Henry Knox, who proposed a brilliant and daring plan to bring cannons to Boston. And I will let Bob Lewis give you the details of this incredible, nearly impossible mission that changed the course of history. So let us welcome Bob Lewis. venue here. <laughs> but the venue uh, requires a technical expert, Ed El Turco. And he met me here two weeks ago to make sure that the laptop with, with the PowerPoint on it and the projector were all matched up and it didn't work. And he spent quite a few hours on that, at that period. And then today, again, <laughs> he needed to work on it again. So really appreciate Ed's dedication and his expertise, his technical expertise, but most of all, the dedication to uh, this group to make sure that the presentations are as, as good as they can be. Henry <coughs> Knox was with Washington all the way through Yorktown, the Battle of Yorktown, the last major battle, and then served uh, as the Secretary of War and so forth. So this is a limited portion of the Henry Knox story, just 
through the siege of Boston. The siege of Boston being defined as the period from the British retreat and conquered, and all the militia gathered, alarmed and alerted by Paul Revere and Dawes and, and other rioters, to come to the aid of the people in Concord. That period until the British, in fact, were uh, left Boston, Boston evacuation in March 1776. Henry Knox, he was abandoned, his family was abandoned by his father, so his mother took Henry out of a Boston Latin Grammar School and was able to get him employment in a bookstore with a benevolent owner of the bookstore who allowed Henry to read all of the books when his, when his duties were finished. And Henry was a voracious reader, had a remarkable memory. He taught himself French with the help of apparently talking to Paul Revere, uh, who apparently also was good at French. The books were ordered from London by the British officers that were, that would, were customers of the bookstore. And of course, because they were British officers, a lot of the books were on military strategy, military equipment, military maneuvers, engineering of fortresses, design of fortresses. And he read those and learned them and memorized them. And he, he developed an interest in this. He was a big guy. He was about six foot three, weighed 330 pounds, had tremendous charisma. The bookstore became very, very popular because Henry was there and people would come just to end it because it was a, such a pleasant place to be, apparently. Henry Knox, 65, he joined the, this organization called The Train, the Artillery Train, which was run by the British, but basically it was a militia company of artillery under the command of the British, and they would practice maneuvering the cannons around on the Boston Common. We had the Boston Massacre, and Henry played a leadership role there. If you recall that story, some the, the locals were throwing chunks of ice and sticks at a sentry outside the uh, governor's headquarters, and, and of course the, the sentry was getting very nervous and threatened to shoot at the crowd, and Henry went up and said, you know, be, be really careful. It's against the law to shoot at civilians unless you have a command from your civil authority. The, uh, in fact, the officer uh, called for some of his colleagues. They showed up, and in fact, they did uh, massacre a number of civilians. Henry opened his own bookstore, which was also successful, and he formed this organization of local, local non-British militia of artillery called the Grenadier Corps. And he, was, uh, he formed it, and he was second in command of the lieutenant. Uh, Henry Knox, uh, had a hunting accident where his shotgun was out hunting birds, uh, and the shotgun blew up in his hand and blew off a couple of his fingers. And so you'll see, whenever you see a painting of Henry Knox, you'll see that left hand is either hidden behind a cannon or it's partially disguised with a handkerchief or something. It didn't, didn't seem to bother him much. And 1775, we'll get to that. Here's the site of the Boston Massacre. Hopefully, been downtown to see this. This is the site, and you can still see this building is magnificent. Still has the golden British lions uh, right here, and the sentries were standing here. It's just a beautiful building. It's just a just great that has been preserved over the centuries. So here's a an etching by Paul Revere of the massacre, somewhat propaganda-like. in an effort, of course, to drum up revolt. So, there's the advertisement for Henry's own first bookstore, and he sells books in all languages, arts and sciences, and he, uh, he read, the, read the books. If he ordered a book, he'd read it. <laughs> so, Lucy Flucker, her parents, their father was the Massachusetts Bay Province secretary, so he was a a British official. Henry had you know, no, no money, no family, no education, no real connections, uh, and he was a rebel. And so, of course, her parents being 
the loyalists were very much against the marriage, but it went forward anyway and was apparently successful. So, in, the, in these times, Boston geography was very interesting because this is all tidal out here. So this is Boston. It's a strange looking piece of land, but all this area in here is tidal, mud flats. And people w would go clamming in here. And twice a day, this would be water. And out here too, this was, this was tidal as well, mud flats. It's all been filled in now. Doesn't look anything like this now. So you had a narrow, what's called Boston Neck, which is the land exit out to the rest of Massachusetts. Oops, did I hit the wrong one? Okay. April, General Gage was ordered to, by the king to enforce these coercive acts and suppress the open rebellion. So shortly thereafter, he ordered British troops to, to conquer, to destroy military supplies. They were under strict orders not to hurt anybody and not to destroy any personal property. The orders are interesting to read in that regard. Spy. Who was the main spy? I think it was the British general's wife, who was an American, who was feeding information to the Sons of Liberty. But you saw the picture of Boston. They could go by boat across to Charlestown, the, the, the soldiers, in other words, if they were going to go to Concord. Or they could walk down the neck and around the land route to Concord. So you remember the old North Church? Up in here, they, the message was going to be some signal lanterns. So the signal was, if the soldiers are going to go to Concord by foot or by boat, cross to Cambridge, uh, then on Concord by foot. So one lantern hung in the old North Church meant what? One if by land. Exactly. Two if by two if by sea. Who was the signal for? Paul Revere. Paul Revere. That's right. Because he had already rode across the night before, under cover of darkness, just past the British battleships over to Charlestown, where he was waiting for the signal. And sure enough, spies reported that the whale boats were lining up on Boston Common, which was at the shore at that time. Edge of Boston Common was the shore of this tidal area. And so they concluded that they were going to basically take the whale boats across Cambridge. And that was a messy, messy night because the poor British soldiers with all their gear had to jump out of these whale boats into this, you know, knee, knee deep mud and then march with wet feet to conquer. So, <clears throat> so they, in boats, the British, uh, the Red Line, they came across here to Leechmere Point, and then they hiked along the Red Line. And Paul Revere, he saw the signal in the old North Church. He was already over here, over, yeah, so excuse me, here, I guess. And he took his, his uh, horse on this route, warning everybody that the regulars were coming out. <laughs> Right here, Lexington, right across the street, is the town green. So Lexington militia had been alerted by Paul Revere, and of course, one of the targets of the British expedition was to capture Hancock and Adams. They were warned and they left town. But the militia did show up. So after the brief skirmish in Lexington, the British marched on to Concord, the, uh, and then he started back after things went badly for him at the Old North Bridge. Uh, Earl Percy, with a, another 1,500 British troops, met the British and, and basically uh, walked back with them, helping to protect them from the, all of the militias that were lined up along here that were shooting at them on the way back. And they, once, once they got to Charlestown, 
they were then able to uh, put up fortresses and so forth so that the Americans didn't pursue them any further. So all these militia, 14,000 men showed up uh, when they heard the alert. The alert system was, was very effective. They showed up and they didn't leave. They surrounded, whoops, sorry, wrong one. They surrounded uh, Boston and uh, built fortresses along here. Uh, they basically blockaded the narrow landmass. So they had fortresses, the Americans had fortresses along here so that the, the British had to use ships to provide all their supplies, all their meat, all their vegetables. The uh, Americans uh, went out to these islands and all these islands out in the harbor and they burned the hay. They, they took all the cattle, took all the uh, stock from those islands uh, to keep it from being used by the British. On the coast, of course, the lighthouses were very, very important to the British because they needed to find their way along the treacherous Massachusetts coast into Boston. So, some of, the sh some of the British ships here, some of the wharfs are still there, Battery Wharf, Long Wharf, are still there. You can walk out, walk along out at these wharfs. Um, some of the battleships were in here between Charlestown and uh, Boston. So lighthouses uh, needed to be destroyed. So they did. The Provincial Congress said, we're going to recommend that the lighthouse on Little Brewster Island and there's two others, one down in Plymouth and so forth. So here's Little Brewster right here. And uh, some troops uh, went out and uh, in the early morning hours, uh, 60 soldiers rode out from Hingham and they burned the, down the lighthouse. The British, embarrassed, quickly rebuilt the lighthouse. So this is, if you look at this, it's only a few days apart. They, they, uh, they, they attacked it again. This time he brought 300 soldiers because now the island had been, became an armed camp. The British needed that lighthouse. Uh, they came out in the whale boats and uh, attacked Little Brewster again, successfully again. And the, the embarrassed British Admiral who couldn't keep this from happening uh, was relieved of his command. So the point of this story, does everything do with Henry Knox? It just kind of tells you there's a lot of other things going on, not just, not just the Henry Knox expedition, but all kinds of other activities, including burning down lighthouses and establishment of privateers, which is, was, turned out to be very, very important. So Ethan Allen, uh, an elected leader of a militia known as unit known as the Green Mountain Boys, came to Fort Ticonderoga in, in, in the early morning. The sentry was asleep. They took over this incredible fort without firing a shot. So, less than 100 guys. And Benedict Arnold showed up. Uh, they crossed, you can see they crossed the Lake Champlain at dawn. Okay. Here's Fort Ticonderoga as it looks today. Beautiful place if you haven't visited. It's really a beautiful location. And this is the, the fortress has been reconstructed. It's right on this is Lake Champlain. So and Vermont over there, Lake Champlain, and this is Fort Ticonderoga. It's a fun place to visit. You can still see some of the cannons are here. This is where Like further, further looking south, Lake Champlain, this is again Fort Ticonderoga. This ridge here, the Adirondacks ridge here, separates Lake Champlain on this side of the, this ridge from Lake George on the other side of the ridge. But there's a river that goes right up here called La Chute River that was used to move the cannons from Fort Ticonderoga.
May. Complete surprise. They run opposed. So, in the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress, replied Ethan Allen, I'm here to enter their fort. <coughs> A map to help you orient yourself. Here, Fort Ticonderoga down here in this little neck of land here. It can, with this cannon, it could keep uh, ships from moving up and down the, uh, Lake Champlain here. And also, because this was the main route of transport here, over here to Lake George, via the Lachute River, up like this, onto Lake George, and then all the way south, was the standard route uh, for, for all kinds of commerce. It's, it's known to be an important route. And I mentioned the ridge, this, this uh, Adirondack ridge here, keeps, uh, kept them from just holding the cannons over here. It, this was the standard route, the standard portage uh, down here to the, down here to Lake George. So, June, Continental Congress, the Army, all the militia gathered in Boston. Continental Congress officially took charge of those troops. Didn't have a didn't have a general. So shortly thereafter, after taking charge of all those troops, Congress uh, chose George Washington, the general and commander in chief of the Army of the United States. Excuse me, of the United Colonies, commander in chief of the Army of the United Colonies, not the Continental Army, but the United Colonies. Why was why was Washington selected? Yes. He was from Virginia. Pardon? He was from Virginia. Exactly. He was he was he was from Virginia, the most populous, most wealthy colony. So they needed that support for that war effort, so they selected a Virginian. He was also the tallest man in the room. <laughs> He's also wearing his uniform every day as a way of saying, oh, by the way, I'm <laughs> That's That's right. He was the only guy that showed up for the Continental Congress wearing his uniform. So it was, it was kind of like a big flag. So you're right. Three big reasons. He was from Virginia. He was the tallest man in the room. And he, was, he looked like a general. He was an extremely dignified looking man, a majestic individual. And, and uh, he also wore his uniform. And he, he had battle experience. He had been a colonel. So he had, uh, he had never led anything bigger than a regiment, but he was, the only other guy was Hancock. And Hancock was suffering from, a, from the gout. And so he was kind of, <laughs> he didn't walk quite like a general at the time. So he was kind of, kind of hobbling from, from the gout. So, and Hancock didn't show up in his uniform either. So, okay. So he left almost immediately from Philadelphia, where the, the Congress made this decision, on his way north, just outside New York City, got a dispatch about the Battle of Breed's Hill and the burning of Charlestown. The uh, dispatch wasn't for him. It was for Hancock. But Washington, I think, wisely said, nah, this could be something really important. I better read it. So he did. And then shortly thereafter, he arrived at Cambridge. So, Breed's Hill, Battle of Breed's Hill, Battle of Bunker Hill had happened already. But it's important for this story. Henry Knox wasn't there, but perhaps he helped build the redoubt. So, redoubt's an earthenwork fortress. And here you can see the guys with the shovels, the pick, pickaxe, they're building this earthenwork so they could hide behind it. Very effective against small arms fire and, and cannonballs, hide behind it. The British saw this activity happening on top of Breed's Hill, and they launched 2,200 British troops 
over to Ch Charlestown. The story is there were some snipers firing at, at them from Charlestown, so they also burned Charlestown. Um, and they made three frontal assaults, all lined up, beautiful red coats lined up, marching up the hill, and were forced back three times with tremendous casualties. But the, um, basic, the story is that the Patriots ran out of gunpowder. And so they had to fall back, had to retreat. But the British had huge losses. This is called a Pyrrhic victory. It's the kind of victory that you can't have happen every day or you lose the war. You lost so many men. Um, so this was a demonstration that militia volunteers fighting for cause they freely embraced could defeat disciplined British mercenaries. To some, to some extent, this is, this is a bit of a myth. And Washington was very, very aware of it. He said, we need a standing army. You can't depend on, on militia. No matter how strong their hearts are and their fervor are, a disciplined, well-trained army will beat them. But in this case, because they were behind defensive positions, uh, the Patriots basically uh, slaughtered the British. Here they are. Not clear who said this, Israel Putnam, General Putnam, or Samuel Prescott who said it. Don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes, to some extent, because they were very short of gunpowder. They didn't have gunpowder to waste. And of course, it also took some time to reload the musket. So you want to wait until, you, in fact, your shot's going to count. The uh, Patriots uh, also were very good at picking off British officers. This was considered to be really contrary to military etiquette at the time. So, General Warren was killed during this battle, and here's when they're being apparently overrun, a painting, uh, when they're being overrun by the British. Here they come marching up. You can see Charlestown burning in the background over here. But this is how the British believed a war should be fought. Here they come. Very, very few cannon here on the side of the Patriots. Another British assault picture. Oh, oops, oops, sorry. Wrong button. So here's uh, Charlestown. See the firing over here from uh, Boston up at Reed's Hill by cannon, the British battleship Lively, the British battleship Somerset, and Falcon were, st were also firing their, uh, their cannons at, at the Patriots up here in Breed's Hill. Diorama of, uh, diorama of this battle. See, it's all mud. Looks like a photograph. Yeah, well, it may be a photograph of a diorama. Yeah. Good people of, of Boston up on the rooftops looking toward Charlestown, watching, watching Charlestown burn over here, watching the British battleship firing. Uh, June 17, 1775. After this, Washington. Uh, showed up and formed the, the army from the gathered militias, and George Washington took command. He's, he was a phenomenal, phenomenal individual. He was perfect for this job. He was dismayed to find out that they had, and he had to get all the militias to fill in reports, and you know how much soldiers like doing reports. Reports were inaccurate early on, and then he incarcerated some of the people who were responsible for the reports. So you get the, the reports that were accurate. Found out he had only 36 barrels of gunpowder, and he needed 900 to repulse a British attack. So this had to be, this was highly classified. It had to be a real close hold. He couldn't let anyone, other than this small inner circle, know that they didn't have any gunpowder. It was equated to nine shots per infantryman. It doesn't count any 
Cannons. <coughs> Okay, what else was happening? I told you about the lighthouses. This is another activity. The British wanted to retaliate for the activities. And so they went to, up to Portland, Maine. And the, to me, the most significant thing is here, the time of year this is. If you have your town burned down, just before winter, all your food has been stocked Everything, all your bedding, everything that keeps you warm, it's, uh, it's going to be destroyed. You're going to be, be, if you survive the winter, it's going to be amazing. So the British burned it, burned it down and upset burned it, uh, Washington a great deal. Washington needed the cannons. Some stories say that Henry Knox came up with the idea. Why don't I go to Fort Ticonderoga and, get, and bring back the cannons? Washington, being a really clever guy, he realized that the con those, those cannons didn't belong to him. So he, he corresponded with Congress to get them to approve it, and they did. And then his, Henry and his brother, William, set out for Fort Ticonderoga via New York City and, and departing in the winter, the dead of winter. Now, I'd just like to read this to you, because I. This, this story, they don't tell you how he worked it out, but they tell you when he got there, what happened. Knox went to Fort Ticonderoga, especially interested in the dozen or so big 18-pound guns and 13-inch mortars. But when he asked for custody of them, the New York Provincial Congress refused, annoyed that previous shipments of ammunition had not yet been paid for. New York delegates would not trust Knox's promise until he had money to back them up. The attack on Boston would have to wait. Doesn't tell what he did. Doesn't tell how he resolved this problem. Perhaps General Schuyler came with money. Not, it's com completely unanswered. But it wasn't as easy as you might think. And some of the history books say, yeah, he went to Tycho and brought, brought back the cannon. But the New, York, New Yorkers didn't want to give up their cannons. So here was General Schuyler. He, uh, Schuyler built New York, named after him. Uh, he knew Washington. And he responded to General Washington's request to provide Henry Knox with every necessary assistance and more money if he needed it. So he, he came into play here several times, helping Washington line up oxen and line up the sleds, get the sleds built for the, all the cannons. Some of the cannons were 11 feet long, weighed 5,000 pounds. They were, they were monstrous devices and tough to move in the snow. <coughs> Some of the cannons are still there, fun to look at. My kids, my grandkids like sticking their heads in the mortars. <laughs> heads in the mortars. As you can see, you can, you can imagine my granddaughters sticking their head way down in the mortar there. Notice that the, uh, notice this one has this hollow here. So this could be filled with some kind of gunpowder and a fuse put in here. Then you put the charge in here. Then you put this in here, then you light, the, light this fuse, get a junior guy to do it, <laughs> and then you light the fuse that, that goes down here and to blow the charge out. I think that's probably why they had short barrels to some extent, because you had to, you had to reach inside to light this fuse here. If it was a you know, five foot long barrel, it'd be tough to see. Okay. Reenactment at Fort Ticonderoga of them preparing the cannons for the trip to, to Boston. So this is what the inside of the fort looks like today. Another reenactment. So the trip. Trip to move the cannons down here to, to flat bottom scows and then up the La Chute River. They, they moved them 
up to about here on the Lachute River. The Lachute, Lachute, Lachute River goes up like this, and I'm like this, and then right into Lake George. They couldn't do that because there's a falls, beautiful falls right here. Uh, this road that they, after they pulled the uh, cannons off the boats, is still called Portage Road. It's it may have been called Portage Road before by the, you know, by the local Indians. But, but this is a, the northern end of, of Lake George. There's the falls. Still there, still beautiful. Used for electric power for, for many years. Okay, now, Henry Knox's diary is really scant. Really, really scant. And you can see how scant it is. What he did on December 6th, he moved the cannon from Fort Chicago down to the lake and put uh, a, a, a boat that they could go up the La Chute with. And then this is the overland portage portion, point of getting the cannon from the bridge on the La Chute to the landing at Lake George. And then the next entry is December 8, ditto for the mortars. So you can see how, how scant his diary was, and there's five pages, five days missing from it. Not much for historians to work with. Here's a gondola, gondola and a single, single mast, flat bottom, could be rowed and could be pulled along. So this is after they loaded the, uh, about the 60 tons of cannons on this at the northern end of Lake George, they proceeded south. Lake George is about 32 miles long. The lake was not frozen that year, so they used, used the sail. The wind uh, blew up against them. Yeah. One historian believes that the boat ran, ran aground right here. They're able to get it back off. There's a, there is a big rock that you can you can see when you're out here. That's on Slim Point. There's a rock at uh, when the, there's a drought. There's a rock that's right here. But uh, beautiful area. This is Lake George. It's about about a mile and a quarter from here to the other side. And 32 miles long, an aerial satellite picture. Uh, so the first night, they struggled against the wind, and they were exhausted. They pulled into Sabbath Day Point, where some uh, very civil Indians uh, fed them a really nice dinner of venison, according to what Henry Knox wrote. A place called Sabbath Day Point. The next day, this is a, a picture of the flat area at Seventh Day Point uh, with one of the Knox monuments. Okay. The next day, they headed out and the gondola foundered. And they were in fairly shallow water, so the gondola kind of settled with just the gunnels, the edge, upper edge above the water. So they started, I'd like to have you imagine what that would be like. Ice coming in from the sides, and you're there up to your knees, bailing out this gondola. You're standing in ice water. I think the pain would have been just hard to imagine. Okay, so looking at the right-hand side of the boat, this is what Henry's brother uh, saw. What did you see looking out the other side, the port side? Uh, went the wrong direction. This is the starboard side, and this is the port side. <laughs> so, who bailed it out, reduced the load. They went back to Sabbath Day Point. They took out some of the mortars. They relo reloaded the gun loads to, to shift the weight a bit. And then they, two days later, they were able to make it all the way down to Fort George where Henry Knox was waiting for him. His brother William had been the skipper of the gondola. Here, George, uh, Henry had been working to uh, buy, had sleds built for the cannons 
hoping that there'd be enough snow. What else was going on? Privateering was going on big time. The capture of this brigantine Nancy was, was really important to the Continental Army uh, because there were 2,000 muskets, 31 tons of musket shot, and 7,000 rounds for cannon. And uh, some of the cannonballs, in fact, matched what Henry needed. And Henry learned about this. By the way, this was Mr. Henry Knox at this point. He did not have a commission. It was Mr. Henry Knox. He had asked for commission. Continental Congress said, OK, we'll make you a lieutenant colonel. And he said, nah, nah, nah. I want to be a colonel. So he turned it down. Okay, Knox, Knox Trail. After Lake George, on sleds, they crossed the, the Hudson the first time here at Glens Falls, they came down, they crossed the Mohawk River here, lost a cannon through the ice here, the, lake, the rivers were not frozen solid enough, they came on down, and uh, terrible snow here, snow was exhausting the animals, uh, they could only, only make a couple miles a day because the animals breaking trail through the snow was uh, exhausting them. So he, Henry had prayed for snow and he, he got too much. So, so, New Year's Day. Henry was trying to find a good place to cross. So he and his men, up and down the river were, with axes, were cutting holes in the ice, looking for, for where the ice was thick enough. Notice that this gentleman here is carrying an axe. And the idea was when the, when the, when the cannon fell through the ice, and at one point it did, made a 14-foot hole, uh, his job was to protect the oxen by cutting the ropes to the sled. And this worked. Three, three cannons fell through the ice, uh, and I have not read that any of the oxen were lost. And of course, the oxen were extremely important to the Teamsters. Those were, those were very important to the Teamster. Uh, that's how he supported his family and so forth. Got a tableau. Yeah, January 9th, they got the last of the cannons that they were going to get across, across the Hudson. One fell through uh, just off of Albany, but the good people of Albany came out. The cannon had ropes attached to it, 5,000 pounder. The good people of Albany came out on the Hudson and helped drag that one up. Uh, so they lost, they lost just two. Some, some, some history books say they didn't lose any. Uh, that's false because I've seen at the museum at Fort Ticonderoga two of the cannons that actually fell th through the ice and were left there were recovered, you know, 100 years later. But this is what it looked like. That's a sled and uh, with, a, with a mortar on it. Okay. So after, after Albany, they came down here and then they entered the Berkshires. And this was tough going because the roads weren't good and it was, it was cold and there was a lot of snow. Now, you, you can imagine, you've done this before with kids on a sled behind you coming downhill. The sled runs into your ankles. Well, this was a little bit more severe because it had to wrap ropes around trees and so forth to retard the, the sleds from just screaming down and hurting, hurting the uh, oxen or hurting the humans. Um, so they, they had to work at this and had to plan ahead, of course. They didn't want to crush anybody. This, this picture looks, looks a little fake because um, I, I didn't read of any soldiers being with them. And uh, your Dr. Cudahy. Uh, said, no, you don't march with fixed bayonets because when this guy slips and he falls into the guy ahead of him, that causes a domino effect that's undesired. Right. 
and went up and over. They didn't go up valleys. They went up and over the mountaintops. Okay. So the, the New York Teamsters wanted to go home, so had a struggle to hire new Teamsters. The snow had melted. The, the sleds uh, were not going to do real well on the uh, frozen uh, dirt roads. Uh, so Henry had arranged new, new Teamsters to haul the, the, uh, the sleds the rest of the way. A lot of people, of course, along this trek had never seen a cannon before. They came out to see a cannon, and uh, and the team, the Henry Knox's team, uh, would would fire one of the big cannons and uh, just delight everybody in town. And then the t everybody in town would buy him drinks. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this is uh, George Washington's headquarters. This is where uh, Washington hung out. It, apparently, it's a beautiful place. And this is the uh, the Knox Monument. At this at this place, General Henry Knox delivered to George Washington in January 1776. The uh, so this is in Cambridge. Most other towns, like my town of Weston, the uh, the sign says, through this place, General Henry Knox passed with his train of artillery. Oh. So, Norfolk, Virginia. Just to give you an idea of some of the other things that was happening that were uh, would be in the news and it would, would, would affect the whole attitude and behavior of everybody, was the fact that the British ships in Norfolk Harbor uh, burned down burned down Norfolk, Virginia. There's another side of the story, and I'll let you investigate that on your own. So, <coughs> fortifications here. These fortifications were just really amazing. Fortifications here, kind of a moat here. This was a gun uh, floating battery. So it was a boat with some cannons on it. Um, and then right up in here, there's another, another fortress, British. So it made the idea of assaulting uh, British forces. And of course, this is, this is Boston Neck. I shouldn't say that. So up in here is Boston. So getting there, assaulting it by land, wasn't, wasn't attractive at all. Dorchester Heights, up in here. These, these hills are gone now. But they were apparently memorable heights, as you know, it says in some of the readings. This is where they were going to put the, the cannons up on Dorchester Heights. As seen from Beacon Hill. Beacon Hill is also not the Beacon Hill it used to be because it was scalped off and the land used to fill in the, the tidal marshes of Boston. Here's Dorchester Heights, the actual location of it. and relevant to uh, where the ships would be and, and, and where Boston was. So, the plan was, they now, they now had the gunpowder they needed, they now had the manpower they needed, and there were some reports that huge reinforcements were coming in from Great Britain to Boston. So Washington wanted it's to use the new cannon, wanted to drive the British out. So on March 2, using some of Henry Knox's cannons, place at, places at Leachmore, Leachmere Point and Roxbury, they started firing on Boston to make a noise, basically, and the British fired back. And then they did it again on, on the 3rd of March at night. And the 4th of March, under cover of darkness, 3,000 soldiers worked all night, good moonlit night. The ground was frozen solid, so they couldn't dig. So they, but they had uh, previously made uh, parts of the fortress, and they hauled these things up. These these things called these things here. If I can, these things here, which are bundles of of uh, twigs, basically all kind of bundle, a big bundle of, of sticks like this all tied together, which would uh, stop grape shot and uh, small arms fire. 
So they had made a whole bunch of these things called fascines, and they could uh, hide cannons behind them, and they also had some protective value. So they had visual, these guys here couldn't see what was going on up here, and they also uh, put hay bales between the road up Northchester Heights and the British, so that would muffle the sound plus visually obstruct the view. Uh, and they work all night long. Washington was there. He, I mean, he was, he was there in person, urging people on. He was a real man for, for being out uh, with the troops, urging them on. So this was, this was the grand strategic plan. He wanted another Breed's Hill. He wanted them to attack him in his, in his prepared defensive position, but this time now with cannons. And this time with 6,000 men that he moved up to Dorchester Heights. Uh, so, move the cannon into position, and then, um, yeah. I already said the pre-assembled ramparts are dragged up the steep slope, and then this is kind of novel to me. They had barrels, like uh, whiskey barrels, filled with mud and rock, were prepared, and the idea was you got a slope, and you and you, you see these guys marching up, nice formations, and you let one of these barrels go rolling down the hill, and it, some some records say that the these barrels were hooked together with chains, so that. <laughs> So they would come down all chained together and, and uh, knock you off your feet and maybe uh, break your legs or whatever. So they had these barrels up there as well. General Howe got up the morning of March 4, 1776, and he looked up and he saw and he said, my God, these guys have done more work in one night than my army could do in a month. So he basically got his 2,000 or so men into boats and they were going to assault Dorchester Heights. His admiral said, I can't keep my battleships here with those cannons looking down. They're going to destroy my, my ships, so we have to do something. We have to either evacuate or we have to attack. So how prepared to attack and then a heavy wind basically kind of scattered the boats. And Washington's plan was, and of course how in, how in Washington, when you read this stuff, they're both thinking exactly the same kind of thing. The sec, the second phase here in Washington, if, if he could lure Howe's troops out into engagement, then as soon as they started their assault on Dorchester Heights, these three American generals would cast off in transports from Cambridge with 3,000 American troops, row across the mile of the Charles River, with the Charles River at that time, and they would assault the fortifications in Boston. But Howe canceled his plan, the assault, and instead decided to evacuate Boston. And it made, made sense. Didn't it? Because he could use his troops, rather than having them die there in Dorchester Heights, he could use them to better advantage in a future battle. So the, the order never came to Putnam, Sullivan, Green to make their assault by boat. And historians think this was really lucky for us, because this would have, the Americans would have gotten, gotten there in their boats, and if they couldn't, in fact, defeat the British, they couldn't <laughs> retreat. So they, so it was either the British were all going to be annihilated or the Americans were all going to be annihilated. And the British were well dug in in Boston. So it was a, like extraordinary stroke of good luck that uh, this plan wasn't executed by boat. Okay, so here's Dorchester Neck and Dorchester, just another view of it, that's all. You can see uh, Castle Island here. And some of you have probably walked around Castle Island. So, 9, nine March, 
to cover his uh, packing up to go. How uh, rain 700 cannonballs down in Dorchester Heights, and the uh, the locals ran out and picked, and picked up all the cannonballs to use them in the future battles. Yeah. Here's GW. Gilbert, another Gilbert Stewart. In preparation for the evacuation, the um, the British, of course, dumped a lot of surplus cannon in the in the in the river. They burned. Castle William, which is now Castle Island. Um, uh, and so this was a sketch by a British engineer who, was, who uh, was, played a role in this burning uh, and then the, uh, the preparation for the evacuation. Here's an engraving. 1,000 loyalists, 9,000 British troops, over 200 ships. Uh, sailed out. And it took quite a few days, as you can imagine, for this to happen. The arrangement was that if Washington did not impede this, this uh, evacuation, then the British would not burn down Boston. The last guys to get on the, the ships were apparently a rear guard, and their job was, in fact, they had picked out some of the really finer homes in Boston to torch if Washington suddenly started some kind of an assault or some kind of a, a cannon uh, activity. So that was the, the trade. They didn't go, they were headed for Halifax. Some of, the, some of the British ships waited in the outer harbor. They were waiting until around 22 uh, March. Because, of course, there were always ships coming from Britain with supplies for the British Army. So they left a couple of ships in the outer harbor, the idea of saying, hey, we've moved on to Halifax. Set sail for Halifax. Don't go into Boston. <laughs> we've abandoned Boston. Eventually, some cannons put up in Nantasket and convinced the British ships to leave. And, of course, perhaps it was just you know, this time, maybe they figured there weren't any more ships coming. They were, they were wrong. A British ship did show up and sailed merrily, <laughs> tied up in the wharf of, uh, in Boston, and were welcomed by <laughs> all these people were delighted to get all these free goods. So, who first marched into Boston after the British left? Perhaps this is Washington's most important victory, not just the battles, but long-lasting victory, was he was a real believer in inoculation against smallpox. And in fact, if you wanted to join the Continental Army after 1777, you had to be inoculated, because a fifth of his army was always ill. So it wasn't a triumphant march into Boston with Henry Knox in Washington leading the band. Instead, he sent in 500 uh, troops. The requirement was that they have pockmarked faces to go into Boston, because he was feared that maybe Boston, in fact, harbored a lot of, uh, of smallpox. The British had, in fact, put up a whole bunch of dummies, like straw men, uh, scarecrows, in uniform in various places. Yeah, and Charlestown to, uh, to slow down the, the victory, victorious entry. So he sent in 500 people, and then after they said, now nah, there's no smallpox, then they, in fact, did have a uh, triumphant march into, uh, into Boston. Now, I think this is, to me, one of the more interesting things, is that this whole evacuation of Boston, the Battle of Bunker Hill, the end of the siege of Boston, happened well before the Declaration of Independence was ever signed. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>
Well, he was the he was the British British general, but he um, he had been replaced by Howe. How many pieces were there that they dragged down? He started with 59, and he lost two and went through the ice, and some, uh, a couple of mortars were left by and left behind at uh, Sabbath Day Point. Oh, that's, and, and there was just the one ship that did it go back and forth? Or how no, the gundalo. Yeah, the gundalo. My understanding, his brother William was skipper of, of the one gundalo. So it had 60 tons of cannons on it, when it's, which is why it foundered, right? <laughs> it was overloaded. Yeah. And they did bring some ammunition with them from Ticonderoga? No, record, no record of any gunpowder, but lots of musket balls. Musket, musket balls. Cannonballs? There was a piece in the globe. I can't remember the I can't remember anything about cannonballs. I, I'm sure he brought back whatever he could, I, I, but I, I don't know that one. Thank you for the questions. I've read more than once that uh, they at Dorchester Heights they had no gunpowder. That you said that they did. They they had gunpowder and they used it at from uh, Leechmere and from Roxbury the cannonade that went on during the nights. But I've read nothing that says they actually fired the cannons from Dorchester Heights ever. But I thought that was because they had no gunpowder. That may well have been. They were scary enough without it. Exactly. They also had uh, taken some trees and painted them black. So they looked like cannons from a distance. So they looked, they were quite a camouflage activity. Uh, but they, they suffered from shortage of gunpowder throughout this era, throughout this time, for sure. Your story, with its tremendous heroic action, simply makes me think again like I do every day. For those guys, thank you for our freedom. Yeah, yeah. I, I, if you want to do a reenactment next November and, and walk up to Ticonderoga, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> 300 miles, 300 miles in late November. I just think it's just an unbelievable thing. And then walk back, too. <laughs> did the colonists always have to borrow their cannons, or did they ever build any foundries and start manufacturing? They did uh, eventually have some foundries. And I think Henry Knox basically was the father of the foundry, the cannon foundries. But he was also, you know, the. Uh, had a really important role to play in West Point. Uh, I think he was uh, maybe the father of the fortress there at West Point. But they had no foundries at this time, but they did, did eventually get some cannon foundries. I, I should like to add that further reading, I found, of course, that Henry Knox became a confidant of President Washington. Oh, yes. Washington had a cabinet of guys who all wanted to be president. They had their own axes to grind. And Henry Knox, cool-headed, far good thinker, advised Washington how to run the country. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, Henry Knox was apparently really a, really a decent guy, too. Apparently really a generous man. Um, apparently there were some hard times up in Maine after he uh, became the governor of that area and help people through some really hard times through generous uh, employment of them. But obviously he had tremendous charisma and tremendous leadership ability because he was able to execute this with all, all the different hardships and the different groups people wanted. The Teamsters always wanted more money, uh, the weather, things breaking down. <coughs> So the, the Teamsters were, were not militia. That's right. They were private commerce, you know, all people. Contract. Pardon? They're contract. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And their contract said from Ticonderoga to over the Berkshires. And then we're done. State line. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get home. More questions? I always remembered how Henry Knox died. It was, it was awful. He was having a family dinner on a Sunday up in Vermont, and he choked on a chicken bone. And um, it took him several days to die, but the bone was lodged in his intestines. Isn't that a dreadful way? Yeah. To end? Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was terrible. So yeah. anticlimactic. Any further questions? Yes, hang on. You mentioned that uh, the signal in Old North Church was to uh, Paul Revere over from Charlestown. I remember reading a letter that he had wrote to his son many years later. <coughs> and in that letter, it noted that he was not in Charlestown. Uh, the signal was sent to Colonel Conant over there in Charlestown to dispatch his writers. And curiosity was killing him as to whether or not everything went well. So he decided to go row across himself. And he also assisted, I think it was John Newman and Paul Pulling, was it? Get into the Old North Church. So once they were in, he locked the door and went home. And uh, about an hour later, he then decided he was going to go over to Colonel Conant and see how things went. Uh, I don't remember where I read this letter, but I remember reading it. I'll, I'll have to look into it. Yeah. Thanks. It I know fine. he set up the signal system, yeah. but then I had heard that he rode across <coughs> waiting for the signal. Rode across the, the Charles, uh, and the <coughs> British battleships were right there and kind of rode right next to him, and then the, then the moon came up. And now he was very shortly about to be exposed by moonlight. But he made it across in time. Yeah, he mentioned that in the letter, and he had to wait and time the sentry on the, the ship, on his rounds around the, the, the deck of the ship. So he had to wait until the, the, the sentry was headed down the back side of the ship or front side, wherever side it was. And, uh, and then he rode across, so that then he was out of view for most of the time because of the way the sentry was. Fantastic adventure, huh? <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was it was a letter that uh, he had written to his son. So, uh, and I want to say it was in the 1800s, but uh, I, I don't remember. And I have no idea where I read it, I, but I do remember reading it. I'll have to take a look at it. Thanks. Okay, another big hand, yeah. please. Yeah.